Now, this was reported in the in the US military publication, The Stars and Stripes. It was also reported extensively in the Soviet Union, because they were quite proud of having recovered this thing. Now, if it was a practice capsule, let's say, and it had fallen off the side of a ship, oh dear, oh, it's gone, oh, it's, oh, it's drifting away, oh, somebody will pick it up, somebody might have said. It's a long way from Florida to the Bay of Biscay. How long would it take to drift there? Five, six weeks, maybe? If it had drifted there, there would be barnacles and seaweed and, and all the stuff that you get when a ship is in the sea for too long. But there was none of that visible on it. It's as if it had just fallen off the side of a ship and been picked up the next day or came down from space. I'm not saying it's the official Apollo 13 command module because I don't know. But I do think it is particularly weird that this command module, be it a boilerplate or a real capsule, which you can't see inside now because it's sealed, was recovered by the Soviet Navy. And they handed it back because that's what you're supposed to do. If you find any nation's space artifacts, you hand it back to the nation that originated it. And that's what the Soviet Navy did. But it's very, very strange story. And the coincidences start to add up. Found the day after the official launch of Apollo 13. It was way off course if it was for real. Because normally when you launch a rocket from Cape Canaveral, it will fly out over Africa. And the first thing you'll look out for what's called the Eye of Africa. It's a very visible physical feature in Mauritania. It's about 20 kilometers in diameter. It's three concentric circles, hence the eye. Astronauts flying out would look out for it and say, oh, at least we got to Africa, guys. Let's go on a bit. We'll get to India next and, and, and maybe South America. And then we'll go on round. But Mauritania is about 1,500 miles south of the Bay of Biscay, the deserts of Mauritania. NASA will not even address right, the issue. Right. And NASA have a habit of refusing to acknowledge it. Let me ask you this right off the bat, if you don't mind. Do you believe we have put men and women into space? Oh, yes, definitely. Men and women have been into space since Yuri Gagarin allegedly flew the first orbit of the Earth in April 1961 which was followed six weeks later by John Kennedy and his address to the Joint Houses of Congress. We will land a man on the moon before the decade is out and return him safely to the Earth. At that point, no American had been into orbit. John Glenn was the first American to orbit, and that was a year later. John Kennedy didn't know if it was possible to do it, but he was doing this as a political response to the considerable surprise that the Soviet Union had orbited Yuri Gagarin six weeks earlier. He had to be seen to do something about it. I don't forget John Kennedy had only been in office since January of that year, 1961. He was inaugurated in January. He'd already had to deal with the Bay of Pigs fiasco, so his presidency got off to a bit of a shaky start. So he decided that he would put forward this idea of landing a man on the moon. It's just something which would G up the American public after the ridiculous performance in Cuba, the Bay of Pigs. Going to the moon was quite an undertaking, and this is the problem. So this is my challenge to your audience. If you can prove that humans have landed on the lunar surface and returned safely to Earth, I would love to hear it. Because going to the moon, there are three major problems which have to be overcome. You have to have a rocket to do it, a Saturn V rocket. We have to get through the radiation problem, which NASA still admit today is a problem. The Soviet Union or the Russian Federation as it is now acknowledge that it is a problem. They've said so. And then the biggest problem of all is getting back the re-entry through the Earth's atmosphere at the same speed you leave Earth at, which is 25,000 miles an hour, i.e. very fast. You have to slow down and you use the atmospheric friction to remove the kinetic energy of the spacecraft and convert it into heat so you need a heat shield to protect your capsule in which the astronauts are before the parachutes can open and they can drop into the, in this case, the Pacific Ocean. But how did that heat shield work under the conditions that we're told it did? Because the Apollo command modules returned on what's called a direct entry. I, they came straight in, whack, hit the atmosphere, slow down, parachutes open, splash, pick up, big heroes. That's how we're told it happened. The Soviets have never used direct entry. They use what's called skip entry, where they come in, bounce off the atmosphere to remove some of the speed, and then, having slowed down a bit, they can come in under a more controlled manner. And if you look at any spacecraft that returns from the space station, they're the only ones we can see nowadays, 
They don't come in at nearly the same speed, 17,500 miles an hour. That's the orbit speed of the ISS. So the returning capsules have to slow down and they use heat shields on it. And the heat generated is much lower. It's a much less amount of heat at 17,500 miles an hour than at 25,000 miles an hour. And if you look at any of the, the Soyuz command capsules returning from the ISS, they're basically black from the heat generated and the soot created by the ablative material, which is a type of resin which destroys itself and protects the craft inside it. Now, there's something that uh, you may have heard a little bit about. It's called the Orion capsule. This is Apollo 2.0, and it's going to be launched on whatever rocket they decide to put it on, the, the SLS, the Space Launch System, which is the only surviving part of the Constellation program, which was cancelled by Obama in 2010. The Space Launch System was retained by Congress because they had mandated that NASA should use an American rocket. Because the only way they could get to the space station for a long time was using Russian rockets. And the only way they could launch very much into space was using Russian rocket engines, the RD-180s. Very, very successful engine. So what you've got here is a reliance on the Soviet Union, or the Russian Federation now, to reach the ISS. We've only just seen SpaceX take their Dragon capsule with two astronauts on board up to the space station successfully, which was a good thing to have seen. But when you've got this problem of returning from lunar orbit, which is not the same thing at all as returning from the space station, it's returning at 50% increase in speed, which if you use the inverse square law, you've got to have twice the protection. When the Iran capsule was tested in December 2014, i.e. six years ago, and don't forget Apollo only took seven and a half years from a standing start to landing on the moon, the Iran capsule, or the, the heat shield, almost failed. So why didn't they just use what was successful on Apollo? Oh, they lost the formula. Oh, goodness, like they've lost the plans. They've lost so much of Apollo. They lost all the original films and the biometric data. Very careless, that. It's a ridiculous idea that they lost it. It probably never existed in the first place, which is why they can't find it. A great deal of the biometric data was allegedly found in a disused McDonald's restaurant somewhere in Louisiana, I think it was. They're not very careful about looking after their technology. So one has to question whether the technology exists. So that was my original challenge. Here's part of my argument with that. In the late 1950s, the United States government was developing the SR-71, which could fly at Mach 3.3. That full number was never, ever disclosed. It is still top secret to this day, which means that it was close to hypersonic speed. If not, could be hypersonic. We don't know. All right, so if we had the technology in 61, to fly an aircraft and create an aircraft of that magnitude and that speed at that altitude, which was well over 80 plus thousand, 90,000 feet, why couldn't we turn that technology into rocket technology to boost ourselves into space and to make the run at the moon? That's a very logical conclusion to reach. But the SR-71 used a ramjet engine. It didn't use a rocket, basically a jet engine. I'm not sure it flew as high as 80,000 feet. It certainly flew very high, because that was its main defense against missiles being fired at it. 2,000 missiles were fired at the SR-71 over its 20-year period. None of them hit it, which is obviously a successful mission, but it was an aeroplane, it wasn't a rocket. Yes, the technology had been developed, and it was an extremely advanced aircraft. It's probably the most beautiful aircraft ever designed. It was a fantastic machine. It could do incredible things. Ironically, one of the reports from the SR-71 ties in with the duplicity of NASA. So they were flying over Vietnam in the early 1970s. They had to be refueled twice coming back over the Pacific to America. And one of the pilots said he wanted to just have a chance to look out at the canopy of stars above him. Now, flying at 70, 80,000 feet, the stars would be brilliant. So he switched off his cabin lights just for a few seconds. And once his eyes had adapted to the dark, he said the starlight above was so bright it could illuminate my flight controls, which rather puts a different aspect to the story that you couldn't see stars in space. Of course you could see stars in space. They're all over the place. They're huge. There's a vast amount of stars. And when you're in space, there's no atmosphere to diffuse them. You can see anything. And the other point about space travel, proving a 
Apollo's falsity was some of the first space shuttles were flown. The first one was Columbia in 1981. Once the space shuttles had got their act together a bit, because it took 10 years to develop the space shuttle from the end of the Apollo era, you'd think they'd just stick the thing on top of a Saturn V rocket, but no, they had to develop a whole new propulsion system. Well, why? Why not just use what was successful with Apollo? It could lift more than the shuttle launch system. The huge red fuel tank and the two external solid fuel boosters did not have the same power as the Saturn V rocket. Anyway, once they got the shuttle up there, astronauts had to work outside when they were launching satellites or they were doing work outside. The astronauts would complain every time the shuttle flew into the shadow of the Earth and it spent half its time in the shadow of the Earth, i.e. no heat. They complained that their hands got cold, so cold they couldn't work. And NASA said, no, so stupid, of course you can work, you know, just get on with it. They said, no, 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 seriously, this is very cold up here. Because in the shadow of the Earth, there's no heat, there's no radiant energy of the sun. And for half the orbit, they're in the shadow of the Earth. So NASA said, OK, take some temperature readings and let's just see how they vary. You'd think they'd have worked out by then, by the time the shuttle was flying in the 1980s, what the temperature of space was, but no, they had to do it all over again. So they took temperature readings up there, and the report said that within a few minutes, having come out of the shadow of the Earth, entering the sun, the temperature increased by over 100 degrees centigrade within a few minutes. So they were able to prove that they needed electric heaters in their gloves, which is what they got. The point about that is that if you're standing in sunlight on the lunar surface, you're in the direct energy of the sun all the time, because there's no shade on the moon, you will be in extremely high temperature. So how do they keep cool? Because humans cannot work in much over about 20, 25 degrees centigrade. You've never lived in northern Canada then, my friend. Could you work in minus 40 degrees? Yes, you can, because people do work in that temperature. They are prepared for it. Let's just say that if you had to wear a spacesuit in northern Canada, where the temperature falls, what, is minus 40 centigrade fair? I'll go outside and snow blow my driveway at minus 25. But they are prepared for it. What I was referring to here was the heat, not the cold. Now we can come on to the cold in a minute, but the heat on the moon will be plus 100, 120 degrees centigrade. That is severely above what you would be comfortable working in. Humans can't work in much over about 25 degrees centigrade, 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So how did they keep cool? Because the longest EVA, extravehicular activity, I moonwalk, was just under eight hours straight. No stops. That was on Apollo 17. They were outside in direct sunlight for eight hours. And this sunlight is the radiant energy of the sun. It's like standing in front of a fire. You know, you've got logs burning in a fire. You can feel the heat coming off them. That's the radiant energy of the logs. And you can't stand in front of that for very long if it's a big fire. On the moon, there's a big fire in the sky. It's called the sun. And that is producing this radiant energy. Astronauts would have to remove some of that energy. It would have to be removed from inside their spacesuit because they're also generating heat themselves by moving around, by doing work. It's a standard procedure. So how did they remove this energy? Because a vacuum, which is what we got on the moon, is the best insulator of them all. You know, like air conditioning dumps heat from inside a room to outside a room. You can't do that on the moon because you can't dump the heat anywhere. The only way you can get rid of the heat is by radiating it away or the explosive decompression of water. So you can carry water with you and you expel that and it will remove heat, but you can't carry enough water. You can calculate how much water is required to remove a certain amount of heat in a certain period of time. And the amount of water that the astronauts carried was about three liters. They would need about 30 liters to remove the amount of heat that we're told will be generated by the sun. So something doesn't add up here. So you've got all these anomalies in the record. It's a great story. And I claim that Apollo, it's a story to persuade us that humans have walked on the moon. Now that was 50 years ago. 12 astronauts allegedly walked on the lunar surface and they haven't been back. Oh, there wasn't enough money. Oh, there's no interest in doing it. Oh, they're just getting around to doing it now, aren't they? President Trump has decreed that humans must be returned to the moon by 2024. That's five years he gave them to do it. You think it'd be simple enough? dig out the old plans of how we did it back then and just do it in 21st century technology. Simple, no problem. What's the holdup? There's huge holdups. 
They haven't got a rocket yet that's been tested. They haven't got a spacecraft with a re-entry testing being done. They haven't got the spacesuits being made. You have to make some for, for the women. It's called the Artemis program, the new return to the moon. Artemis was Apollo's twin sister, so it's reasonable to assume that women are going to be involved somewhere. But none of that has happened yet. It's not simple. Space travel is extremely difficult. And back in the 60s, space travel was cutting edge. It was the high tech of its day. And though it may seem very easy from our viewpoint of the 21st century, from 2020, looking back 50 years, we say, well, they did it successfully back then. You know, they had pretty primitive technology, but they appear to have done it. No, they didn't. It was a brilliantly executed propaganda exercise. So why didn't the Russians blow the whistle? Why didn't the Russians come out and say, oh, didn't happen, couldn't have happened. Okay, that's a reasonable point to make. Who in Russia would have blown the whistle back in the 1960s, 1970s? The head of the Soviet Politburo was Leonard Brezhnev at the time. Who would have had the access to him and have the technical knowledge to know that what we were being shown by the US Apollo program was a fake? Who would have had the knowledge to do it? Why did nobody in the West blow the whistle? Why did no photographers? Why did no engineers? Why did no biologists? Why did no anthropologists? Why did no, no ologists? Why did none of them come forward and say, it's fake? They did come forward and say, it's fake. But nobody wanted to believe them. Nobody wanted to listen to it. Nobody wanted to hear that the emperor has no clothes. They didn't want to believe it, so they didn't. So they went along with the fantasy of landing a man on the moon. But now it's being exposed because if you can't do it with 21st century technology, it certainly didn't happen with 1960s technology. And we've got a real problem here because how is NASA going to explain this one away? I'd love to hear it, I'd love to see it because if I'm wrong, I want to know. But there's a saying that Carl Sagan, who was a brilliant science populist, said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Landing a man on the moon is an extraordinary claim. Where is the extraordinary evidence in support of it? I don't know. I haven't seen it. All right. I got to ask you this. What would the purpose of NASA have for covering up the entire story of Apollo? Good point. You have to take yourself back to the late 1960s. What was happening in America? What was happening in the world? The Vietnam War was starting. It started in 1964 by one of those famous false flag events, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And for 10 years after 1964, until America rather ignominiously pulled themselves out of Vietnam, 58,000 American soldiers were killed, 3 million Vietnamese were killed. That is the price you pay for crass incompetence. So the Vietnam War was getting very unpleasant. The Cold War was ramping up, the Cold War between America and the Soviet Union. Who had the best political system? Who had the biggest bomb? Who could destroy the most people? Who could influence the most nations? That was all going on. There were also riots going on inside America, the Democrat uh, convention in Chicago, where protesters were actually being shot dead by the National Guard. That's how unpleasant it was becoming. So America had to be seen to be succeeding, and Apollo was the success story. Apollo had to be the success story, because everything else was failure and disaster. So Apollo had to be seen to be successful. Whether it happened or not, it was basically irrelevant. It had to be seen to be successful. And the best way to do that is using what America is quite good at, which is creating visual images to support their political proposals. They have access to, a, to Hollywood, they have access to a great deal of technical knowledge within the film business. I'm not saying that Hollywood was directly involved. And before anybody here starts saying, oh, it's all Kubrick. No, it wasn't Kubrick. He was such a perfectionist. He always wanted to, to shoot on location if he could, but he couldn't in this case. And Kubrick wasn't involved. He was busy doing his masterpiece, 2001, A Space Odyssey, which was released in 1968. There were other films coming out as well. There were a lot of people who were very good at special effects on film. Now, just north of Los Angeles, in a place called Laurel Canyon, 
It's where a lot of musicians lived in the early 1960s, who incidentally had a lot of connections with the intelligence services. One of the most famous was Jim Morrison, whose father was Admiral George Morrison, who actually was the American naval commander at the Gulf of Tonkin. So there are interesting connections there. But in Laurel Canyon, there was a US Air Force facility called Lookout Mountain Laboratory, which was a very well-equipped film production facility, basically post-production. Lookout Mountain Laboratories is now a private home. It's owned by Gerald Leto, the singer and actor. But up to the late 1960s, it operated as a US Air Force film production facility. There's also, near San Francisco, a place called Menlo Park. And at Menlo Park is one of the largest buildings in North America, called Hangar One. It was built in the 1930s as a, an airship hangar. It's several hundred foot long. It's vast. You can see it on Google Maps now. Just, just put Hangar One, Menlo Park, and you'll see it. And this is where I suggest that a lot of the filming of the big sets was done because everything could be controlled. It's where Tom Hanks filmed Apollo 13 and the miniseries from the Earth to the Moon. It was all done at um, Menlo Park. It's a huge and controllable environment. Now, whether that is what happened or not, I don't know, but it makes much more sense than saying they went to the moon to film it for various reasons, such as the film wouldn't work. The rockets wouldn't get there. The astronauts wouldn't survive. There were plenty of other places around. Another one is Cinder Lake near Flagstaff in Arizona, where a life-size version of the Sea of Tranquility on which the Apollo 11 landing would take place was constructed by the US Geological Survey. It's called Cinder Lake because basically that's what it consists of. It's volcanic cinder, which is similar to the lunar surface. The US Geological Survey took a few sticks of dynamite and created some craters identical to the craters around which they will be landing on Apollo 11. There is also, near to that location, a landfill site, which had a huge amount of military equipment just dumped, which would make nice rocks if you could spray them with a bit of shotcrete. And that's what appears to have happened. So a lot of what we see as images taken on the moon were taken in Arizona at Cinder Lake. Some was filmed in Hawaii, some in Iceland. These are all similar physical locations to what we'd expect to find on the moon. So what you've got is a plausible explanation for how it was done, but people don't want to believe it. People say, no, no, it couldn't possibly have happened. Oh, those 400,000 people who worked for it, oh, they, they would have blown the whistle. Oh, no, you can't keep a secret. Of course you can keep a secret. The Manhattan Project employed 150,000 people. And the first anybody knew of what they were doing was when the bomb went off over Hiroshima. A million people were assembled for the D-Day landings in 1944. The Germans didn't find out what was going on until the landing craft discharged its troops onto the beaches of Normandy. Secrets can be kept. And the reason that secrets can be kept is very simple. It's national security. If you tell people this is in the interests of national security, most people, being patriotic, will say, OK, I agree with that. I won't be discussing it beyond the people I'm allowed to talk to about it. And they will go along with that. All the astronauts were military. A lot of the senior personnel at NASA were military. The US Air Force was brought in to get the whole operation back on track after the disaster of Apollo 1 when some idiot decided to pressurize the cabin containing pure oxygen at 20 pounds per square inch. Guess what's going to happen? It'll explode if there's an electrical fault, which is what appears to have happened. So the US Air Force was brought in. They introduced a lot of their systems, which had worked very well, and people were willing to go along with it because landing a man on the moon, defeating the Soviet Union, was a matter of national importance and national security. They would go along with it. They're not going to question it. They're not going to blow the whistle. There's no whistle to blow. They just do it as best they can. And that's what they were doing, the very best job they could. They knew what they had to achieve, and by and large, they achieved it. But could the rocket do what it was supposed to have done? Right, I said there were five engines. They produced 1.5 million pounds of thrust each. That's about 600 tons. So a vast amount of energy were the engines up to the job. Could they launch the purported 46 tons into lunar orbit, 130 tons into Earth orbit? That's what we're told a Saturn V rocket did. Since that, no rocket has come anywhere close to achieving that level of power. 
let alone that amount launched into Earth's orbit. The Space Shuttle couldn't do it. The Space Launch System, the new super-duper wonderful new rocket, can't do it. The BFR, the Big Falcon rocket from SpaceX, can just about do it, which hasn't been tested yet. So all this is going on, so there's a lot of publicity about it. Oh, we are wonderful, we're doing all this stuff now. Well, let's see it. Let's see it happen. And whether Apollo did what we're told it did, I think is very much open to doubt, because nobody has been able to prove it. Nobody has been able to come forward with a convincing explanation. Even the Soviet Union were trying to get to the moon. But there's also another point which is not generally known about. In September 1968, i.e. before Apollo 8 allegedly launched, the first contracts were signed between Soviet Union, as it was then, and the governments of Germany, Hungary and Austria to supply them with the one major product the Soviet Union had available for export, natural gas. The whole deal is called Pipes for Gas. West Germany would build the pipes, 2,000 kilometers of four-foot diameter pipe, and the Soviet Union would supply the gas. This would ensure the survival of the Soviet Union because it had no other means of earning foreign currency. They weren't going to blow the whistle on some Americans prancing around allegedly on the lunar surface if it would jeopardize their national income. That is generally not known about, but it's perfectly easy to check out the details of it. Say, Pipes for Gas is, is one of the names given to it. The natural gas in the Soviet Union comes from Siberia and quite a lot of reserves of oil. And there is now a big row going on about what's called Nord Stream 2, which is one of the main pipelines coming out of St. Petersburg under the Baltic and it enters on the north coast of Germany. That's where one of the major supply routes come in. In the mid-1960s, the Soviet Union used as a tracking station Jodrell Bank here in the UK. It's near Manchester in central UK. They used the radio telescope at Jodrell Bank to assist in the tracking of the Soviet spacecraft, especially the Soviet spacecraft going to the moon. It was quite open about it. It was done with the knowledge of the British government and the American government. And the head of the Jodrell Bank radio telescope at the time was Sir Bernard Lovell. And he was invited to visit the Soviet Union on several occasions in the 1960s. And he was quite open about it. He said, look, when are you guys going to send somebody to the moon? When are you going to send a cosmonaut to the moon? And they said, well, we intend to. We've got a rocket to do it. It's called the N1 rocket. We've got a spacecraft in which they'll travel. But we will not be sending a cosmonaut to the moon until we can ensure their safe return due to the dangers of radiation. So they knew about the problem. It wasn't as if it was a big secret. Now, there's an interesting follow-up on that. Also in September 1968, the Soviet Union launched a Zond 5. It's an unmanned Soviet craft. It was launched to the moon. It would orbit the moon and return to Earth. This would be the very first time any capsule launched from Earth would return intact to Earth. It landed in the Indian Ocean. And on board, were two turtles, small tortoises, some plants, some seeds, various other biological life to test what would happen in the radiation. And they landed and the turtles were okay, probably a bit pissed off, but happy to be back on Earth now. And they were still alive, so obviously there was no problem with radiation, was there? Well, it wasn't a very good test because cockroaches will be the one animal that will survive a nuclear blast. Turtles can survive thousands of times higher levels of radiation exposure than humans can. So it wasn't a particularly good test. Because if you go to your dentist to have your tooth x-ray, you will probably have to wear a lead apron, or certainly the operator of the equipment will be wearing a protection against the radiation. Because radiation is cumulative in the human body. And it'll kill you if you get too much of it. So you've got this problem with radiation. The Soviet Union knew perfectly well there was a problem with it. They actually announced it. They didn't put two and two together. They just said, well, radiation's a problem. We won't be going to the moon until we can solve it. Some of the senior personnel at NASA have said exactly the same thing. When we get out beyond the Van Allen belts, we want to be sure that our astronauts are not exposed to a greater level of radiation than they can survive. Well, if radiation is just no worse than a couple of chest X-rays, what's the problem? There's a major problem. It's lethal to humans and we haven't solved it yet, and they're nowhere near solving it. Once the deception was perpetrated originally, it had to be kept alive. 
And we've seen it at the 50th anniversary where you've got all these films of Apollo 11 and First Man and all the other things. There are books about it coming out all the time. There are a lot of people who are put a lot of energy and effort and their integrity is at stake. They're not about to give up easily. They're not going to throw their hands up and say, oh, sorry, guys, we've misled you for the last 50 years. It's not going to happen. Though I would say one thing, President Trump is very well informed about a lot of things which he doesn't talk very much about. He's had to be. That's his business. You've stirred and ruffled the feathers with a lot of people listening tonight because history has told us differently. And, you know, one of the things that has always kind of, you know, rubbed me the wrong way about those who say that this is fake is the word proof. Show us proof, photographs, video evidence. It hasn't been anybody who's ever come out saying that I worked on this project to fake these photos or to fake this video. Why do you think that has been so tightly kept? Partly because there were very, very few people involved in the actual fakery. If we go back to the whole Apollo program from 1961 through to 1972, there was a lot of simulations being done. I mean, that's a normal thing to do. You're going to go to a place you've never been to before, you want to simulate it as closely as you can. Same way that airline pilots are trained on simulators. If you get into one of these simulators, and let's say you're going to land at Heathrow Airport, in my case, you're in one of these simulators, it looks very, very much as if it is Heathrow Airport. You're coming into land, the buildings around you, the sites ahead of you, they will be exactly what you'd expect to see. This is what simulation is about. Apollo had simulators, similar to those um, airline simulators we see today. They had simulators for the command module, they had simulators for the lunar landers. And in order to do that, they had to produce film showing what would be outside the window as the astronauts would be trying to land their lunar landers. So it was filmed and there are pictures of the surface that was filmed for these simulators. They're big sections. These were taken from the lunar orbiter photographs. I'm not talking about the lunar reconnaissance orbiter, that comes much later. The lunar orbiter photographs provided the original material for the simulation to be created. That's what it was about. Nothing secret about any of that. None of the people who were doing it would have thought anything odd about creating a simulated environment to be filmed so that the astronauts could see what they would be looking at as they were landing or attempting to land their craft. That's what it was about. Whether they did land the craft or whether what we saw were film of the simulators. If you're going to do a simulation of, a, let's say, Apollo 11, that was eight days from takeoff to landing. So the simulation would have been eight days. So the crew at Houston, a mission control at Houston, would have been on duty. They had to go through the whole simulated exercise. So they had a satellite launched. It was called the Tetra A satellite, testing and training satellite, which was launched in order that they could be receiving signals as if from space so that when they were looking at their consoles and they were checking through what was supposed to be happening, they would have what looked to them a real signal. They couldn't tell where the signal was coming from. All they're seeing is what's on their screen. But somebody had to create the signal to be sent to the satellite to be received back on at Houston so they could simulate the whole mission. It was done for all the seven missions in total, Apollo 13 we've already discussed. So a simulation took place and it was filmed and it was recorded and astronauts would then be debriefed on it. This is quite normal, nothing secret about any of it. There were people who would have been involved in creating it as the final definitive film of the landing, yes, but not many, probably about 40 or 50 at the most. The astronauts would certainly be involved because if they weren't actually on the moon, they had to persuade the public that they had been on the moon. And if anybody has ever seen the Apollo 11 press conference, where the three astronauts, Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins, sat in front of the world's press for an hour and a half answering questions, and the questions were very enthusiastic questions, they don't look particularly happy. In fact, they look embarrassed. They look almost as if they would rather be anywhere but there. These men who are supposed to be have created an epoch defining event. First man to land on the moon. They look embarrassed. They look unhappy. 
Right, they were certainly trained astronauts. They meant to be trained public speakers. But tough, that doesn't add up. They knew what they were going to let themselves in for. They knew what they were going to be doing. If they felt embarrassed about being questioned by the press, they should have simulated a press conference to get used to the idea. It's not rocket science that they weren't more enthusiastic about what had, they had achieved because everybody around them was so enthusiastic about it. You'd think it would have reflected a little bit on how they behaved. Anyway, I think they went into low Earth orbit, stayed in low Earth orbit for as long as it was necessary for the length of time the mission was supposed to last, and then come back, re-enter, and don't forget coming back from low Earth orbit is much easier than coming back from lunar orbit in terms of speed and danger involved. Uh, because nobody was looking out for them, because nobody expected them to be in low Earth orbit. And they're not that easy to see. I mean, satellites are not that easy to see. And anyway, they would just be the command module. It wouldn't be any more than that, because the huge rocket, the first section was jettisoned about 40 miles downrange. The second section was jettisoned in low Earth orbit, about 100 miles up. So it, it wouldn't be difficult to do it. And who would be looking out for them? Because they weren't expected to be in low Earth orbit. And unless you know where to look, you can see that the uh, International Space Station, it's a huge thing. You can see that when it's at a particular point in the evening where the sun is low in the horizon and it strikes the underside of the International Space Station. If you're in the right place, you know where to look and you know what time to look, you can see it. So if they went into low Earth orbit, did a bit of discussion between uh, Houston, who were also expecting them to be on their way to the moon. So they, they knew what the script was supposed to be. And if you look at any of the Apollo press packs, which are several hundred pages long, they detail everything that happens to the nearest second, from launch to splashdown, is detailed in advance to the nearest second. So they knew what they had to say. They knew what they were supposed to be doing. And my contention would be that Apollo 13 was, was scripted in advance because it encouraged the, because after the disaster of Apollo 12, where there was no television picture, so there was nothing for anybody to watch, they had to get the interest up again. So that's what happened for, in Apollo 13. And then you get on to Apollo 15 where they could take the little buggy onto the moon. And if you look at some of the film of that, there's some very strange effects created by this buggy. Right, so yeah, answer to the question, they went into low Earth orbit, stayed there for as long as they had to for the mission, came back down again as we saw. There are photographs actually showing an Apollo command module being shoved out the back of a Galaxy 130. So it could be they weren't even on the rocket in the first place. Because if that rocket had exploded on the launch pad, they would have to have been killed. Now if they weren't on the rocket, and the rocket exploded, we've got the scenario depicted rather graphically in the film Capricorn 1. And I do wonder if film Capricorn 1 was based on certain information which was known to certain individuals around the film business. And they made a film about it. It's happened so often in the past that Hollywood has put forward stories that are of benefit to the intelligence services. The two industries, intelligence services and Hollywood, work closely together. And the, suddenly it's now coming out that the, the amount of cooperation between uh, the US government, Hollywood, and the intelligence services. You've heard of Operation Mockingbird? That's how mm. it's done. And it's still being done today, it's never stopped, which is why we see such appallingly distorted news. It's being written, not by the reporters who are investigating it, but by people who are trying to ferment an agenda. Um, the vacuum isn't relevant to the operation of a rocket. The rocket produces a thrust against itself. That's how they work. I mean, being in a vacuum is irrelevant, in my view. Jet engines can't work in a vacuum. Propeller-driven aircraft can't work in a vacuum, but rockets can, because it provides its own thrust. So is NASA still hoaxing events of today's plans to get back to the moon? No, I think that NASA have got a major problem on their hands now. They have to do it for real, because enough people are watching and checking out what they're doing in considerable detail because of the access to the internet and YouTube and all the people who are space enthusiasts. I mean, I consider myself a space enthusiast, but we want NASA to be honest. I would love them to succeed. I would love them to go back to the moon, photograph the Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17 landing sites and say, look, we got it the first time. Look, here are the pictures. 
you can prove that, that we did it the first time. I'd love that. I'd love that to happen. And if it does happen, I'll shut up and go away and do something else. But until they do that and provide definitive evidence, and please don't quote the lunar reconnaissance orbiter photograph showing the landing sites allegedly on the lunar surface. Forget it. They're photoshops. And you can prove it. Look at your own house on Google Maps, preferably one with, with taken with an orbiting satellite. And I've looked at one. It's called the GOI-1 satellite. It orbits 640 kilometers above the Earth, 400 odd miles, filming through the Earth's atmosphere in distortion. And you can see individual cars on the road. You can see if it's got a sunroof, so you know which way the car's pointing. You look at your own house, you can recognize the, the features of it. Those lunar reconnaissance orbiter photographs were taken using similar equipment defining 0.4 meters per pixel, and you can't see a damn thing except a few blobs. But we want NASA to be honest, and now they have to be. Have to be. Have to be. Have to be. Thank <laughs> you.